Good evening, and thank you for staying till the end. <laughs> it's a tough act to follow after all these people and all these amazing ideas about love. Uh, mine is very simple. It's about the love of work, and it's about sharing my passion, what I do with you guys. Um, and coming from Spain, which at present is a country with six million young people unemployed, work is something we talk about all the time. I talk about it with my co-workers in the line, the supermarket, and even with the taxi drivers I drove to the airport. Um, it's, a, it's a very hard reality to face that something, work that we have thought we'd fought very hard for and won as a right is actually something not so clear anymore and we don't know what the future of it looks like. But anyway, looking forward, one has to always look back and see where we are and how do we get here. So, the Industrial Revolution, what it did with work is that it made efficiency and productivity the whole focus of what we did. Um, what this brought is, yes, in fact, lots of progress, uh, but it also changed the way we lived. Um, and for many of us, it actually dehumanized our relationship with what we do, um, with, of a man and a woman with his or her work. Um, this very competitive, aggressive system replaced quality with quantity. Skill and craftsmanship was replaced with discipline and anonymity. Quality of work was defined by the quantity of your output. In fact, quality of life was measured by the quantity of things you had to have. And somewhere along that journey, for a lot of people, work became struggle, in fact, slavery. Now, thankfully, to many brave men and women, some of whom we've seen today, in our history, they fought against that oppression and managed to get labor laws passed that defended a dignified standard of living. But globalization has just complicated the equation, as many industries have now dis been displaced to other countries where those rules are not valid. Now, did this global efficiency that industrialization brought to us and brought all these things that we own. Did this make us happier as a whole? Well, the answer is obviously no. Um, we have a lot more disposable goods and we consume a lot more, but this false sense of well-being, of wealth, has lulled us into treating as if this planet was disposable. And it's also very clear that quantity alone did not satiate us. So now, that we're standing once again at a crux of another revolution that is once again fired by technology and human ingenuity. The question is, can we take our chance and fight for quality? Do we want to do that? How could we bring back the focus from the industrialized world of quantity to quality? Quality of life, quality of our work, and of course the quality of our planet, our home. The big difference and the good news is that this new technology, it is within everyone's reach as opposed to the other one. For the first time in human history, information and knowledge are not just a privilege of a few people. What this allows for is raised awareness. Once you and I are aware of injustice or inequality, it is difficult to turn away and not stand up and in solidarity and want to fight against it. Once you've heard of stories of heroism and selflessness in the face of dire circumstances, it is impossible not to stand up and applaud and be inspired and want to do something about it. Awareness that we're not alone. Awareness that our problems are not only ours and maybe not that unique. It also helps put things into perspective to encourage us, to empower us, to, to help us share, to engage and make change happen. And today, for the first time, at the tip of our fingertips, we have technology that can allow for more transparency and traceability. Two concepts that I believe are very, very important, especially when it comes to fair play in any situation. And in this realm of tr using transparency and traceability in the realm and relationship of our work, it empowers a worker like never before, because truly credit can be given where credit is due. People can work in large groups and still sign their own work. Now, this idea really intrigued us. We've been talking about it. You know, in Spain, we've been living, um, as in Italy, <laughs> um, a so-called crisis for the last five years. And 
talking about this, we said, what could we, little fashion design company, do about that? How did it change us? What did that mean for us? We talk, we complain, can we do something about it? And that's where we thought of, what, do I, what if we took all these ideas about quality versus quantity and use technology to do something new? What if we could apply it to a piece of clothing? Uh, and the truth is, the results were quite magical. I'm not going to tell you the whole story and bore with it because I only have six and a half minutes left, but you could go to the website, iuproject.com, and discover for yourself the results of our first experiment. It was very simple. We said we would use technology to trace the human supply chain of each of the pieces that were made. Why? Because we want to celebrate the work of these people and the love that they had the things that they did. We want to reveal to the final consumer who had made the product and how it was made, who was behind the service, and how and why they did it. We wanted to humanize the relationship with what we consume. We want our big mission was we wanted to promote responsible consumption. And how do you do that? You make a thing a story, you make an object more human, you try to make something disposable into something engaging so it's harder to throw away. What we saw that it allowed for was authorship and responsibility, where there had been opacity before. The really, one of the really cool stories that I love to tell people, when we started working on the project, and we worked with one of the largest cooperatives in India, where there's over 250,000 handloom weavers weaving the Madras fabric. Um, the third month, we started to receive less fabric, and that was quite alarming, because we get our fabric in containers by sea to try to reduce our carbon footprint, and we called and said, hey, what happened? Is everything okay? And the answer we got from the cooperative heads was, well, the weavers now see that their picture comes up against their piece of fabric. They're being more careful. They want to make it perfect. That was amazing. We had in some way returned pride back to these people in their work purely by acknowledging their authorship. People we also saw could work in larger groups and still retain their individuality. We bring all this fabric back to Europe. We cut and sew everything in Italy, Spain and Portugal. Um, I'm Spanish, European now, and I have lived through these last 10 years of how work has disappeared from here, especially in my industry. In 10 years, we in Spain have one of the largest companies in the world today, very profitable, which was started by producing everything in Spain, and less than 10 years, they've taken all their business overseas, and what that has left behind is people who go to design school and then get out of there, just fold T-shirts at their stores because they don't have an alternative, because there are no factories left anymore, because there's no no product made here, which means it's very little opportunity for design students. So what we did was we went and talked to ateliers and small factories here in Europe, talked to them about this idea and said, what would, you, would you want to participate? We gave you fabric that came from directly from a weaver and you cut and sew and make it and you can sign your name on it so the consumer would know who made it. They thought we were nuts, but then they agreed because there was really not much other alternatives. And it was, we were so amazingly surprised. There have been so many people from around the world who actually write to these people, who send them little thank you notes and, and who actually are concerned about what's going on in Italy uh, when this recent election happened and are writing to these people. So many times we talk amongst ourselves about what the future model is going to be, especially now when everyone's getting all excited about 3D printing. Mm -hmm. Was it, was it going to be large factories, again, just moving to another place, or is it going to be individual craftsmen? We don't know. And maybe it's a mix of the two, and maybe there's a lot of other things that are going to happen that we don't even know about, that are being born somewhere. But the cool part is that technology allows us to share all these experiments with everyone around the globe. And that's basically what we did. We have uh, no budget. We, you know, went with this idea of what we wanted to do, create unique pieces of clothing, get the fabric from individual craftsmen around the globe and then make it all in Italy when everyone was doing the reverse and sell them at very reasonable prices online directly to the consumer, make a very low margin. The first thing everyone turns around and says, is that scalable? Is that even make business sense? And the truth, what I have to tell you is, yes, it does. It makes perfect business sense because for us, we're in the business of creating the love of our work, of taking back this right to the love of our work. And the exciting opportunity is that the tools that we have right now to share that knowledge have resulted that this little experiment that we did out of our office in Madrid has traveled around the globe. I've been invited to various places with this little experiment to talk about what we've done and how we've managed to connect so many people and do something so radically different in the world of fashion where we are so blasé and there's hardly anything new being offered. 
And the results of these new experiments that are happening in Delhi can be used by anyone, anywhere behaving very differently, not, not like any other fashion company. We actually share all our sources. We tell people where to get things done from. We actually allow them to build products on our supply chain if they want to, with, with their own brands, with their own labels, which is completely unheard of in fashion. So the question is, if crowdfunding can work in New York, then maybe it can in Africa, and we can share that knowledge. And if labor rights have been agreed upon in Europe because of certain reasons, then maybe that experience could be shared in Vietnam, and we don't have to go through the same cycle once again, and we could save time. The future could be that a weaver in India could be collaborating with a farmer in Brazil. The other thing that happens, and this is I'm coding myself, <laughs> is that you know, because of, the, uh, because of the situation, a lot of times you have a protectionist attitude that comes up, you know, local economy, we have to hire taxes, build bigger walls, not allow people in because that's what's ruining us. And me, you know, little Indian, now European, very uncertain of the future, I have to repeat this and tell everyone, and I was so happy to hear that all day today, silly boundaries drawn by men will fade away in consequence when faced with the obvious conclusions about our interdependence, and we're seeing that every day. We're one planet, indivisible, interrelated, and symbiotic. And at this moment, this very difficult time, we have to keep saying that to ourselves like a mantra, because we cannot defend our local economy by offending someone outside of it. We're all part of the same. We need to build a world that is equal and non-discriminatory, where we don't just demand our rights, but we also commit to our obligations. That was one of the reasons we called it the IOU project. Because if we could say that to the second person next to us, I owe you, I owe you to do the best I can, I owe you to, to do the right thing, the best of my work, that would solve a lot of our problems. This is another quote that I love because it, in a way, defines so much about, you know, what I do and how I feel about my work. And of course, there was Ferdinando being funny about, you know, me not wanting to come. The truth is I work very hard because I love what I do. And we're just starting out on this journey and there's so much to go and so many mistakes to be made and corrected. And many times we think about what is our biggest obligation at this very moment. And to me, it is to love what we do because that's really what we can have control over, that we should put out the best of us, that we should passionately do it, because the one kind of love that will not go unrequited is your love for your work. Your love for your work will get paid back immediately in the absolute satisfaction that only work well done can give you. Not even the biggest paycheck can take away the hollow feeling of going through the motions and not doing your best and not producing something that you are truly proud of. And when you're in love with your work and your passion shows, you are inspiring others to find their own work guided by their very principle if they have not been lucky enough to have found it yet. And as a very famous saying goes, if you love what you do, you will never have to work a day in your life. And I promise you, I don't. And I was told to make the message simple because simple messages travel faster. So at IOU, we decided we're going to start a Love Thy Work series. So what we do is we find people who have chosen the path to love what they do, to live their passion, and to sh we share their stories, and we hope to inspire the same in other people around the globe. So if you know, know of a story or you want to share yours, write to us, and we'd love to talk about it. So when I come across young people today around the globe, and especially in Spain, a country where I come from and I'm very worried about, and they ask me about work and how to look for work. I always tell them, ask yourselves when you're going to take a job, if that is a job you are going to love or you love. Because if you don't, keep on looking. And as in all matters of the heart, you will know when you've found it. So love thy work is all I could say. Thank you very much.